Hello everybody. Hello. I hope you had time to grab Coke or coffee because it was lunch. To enjoy my fast presentation. I'm gonna talk about development for semantic web. My name is Timera Turdian. I work at the company here in Vienna called Semantic Web Company. And um, you can't start a presentation about Semantic Web without, well, a bit of introduction, uh, introduction and some keywords of the domain. So maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Uh, the person in the picture, Sir uh, Berners-Lee, Tim Berners-Lee, in 2001 had the vision uh, to bring the web to the next level. And so the semantic web kind of got inspired, got created, but it, it's actually still a process, yeah? Here we are 14 years later, it improved a lot, and it's coming. People are already making serious money on it. So I think it's very valuable that everybody knows how to develop for the semantic web. Um, I'm not going to go into the principles of semantic web or link data. I hope you are a little bit familiar with what semantic web is. But you can get a good idea by looking on the slide. It's all about triples, which are expressed in subject, predicate, object uh, way, about RDF, about shape, uh, schemas, ontologies, classes, and most importantly, URIs. All the resources on the web, on the semantic web, have a unique resource identifier. And this being said, I kind of already created a very small link data cloud on my slide surrounding the topic of uh, this domain of semantic web. But um, actually the cloud, how it's called, the linked data, linked open data cloud, is growing constantly. This is an image from April 2014. Uh, where you see different uh, domains, different uh, resources, which are linked together and can be used, can be tapped into uh, by you, by developers, by everybody, because this is the future of the web. At the moment, we are talking about a web which is created through linking documents, whereas the semantic web is created through linking data, yes. So that was part of the introduction, sorry there's no more. But at the end I have a resource referenced, uh, another talk of mine, which is talking exactly about the introduction into semantic web. Nevertheless, you find a lot of resources online already. Today, what I'm gonna show you is a demo application created with uh, semantic web technologies. Okay, I managed to zoom in. The application is, call, is called uh, Sparkling Cocktails. And uh, immediately you see a main menu which has two, um, 10 main alco alcoholic beverages which you can choose from. And then you have uh, non-alcoholic beverages and garnish. Yeah, and based on your selection, uh, you can mix your cocktail. Yeah. So we have more specific types of rum and uh, so on. And in the bottom, you see uh, cocktails popping out, which contain uh, cachaça in this example. So if I click on the cocktail, what you get is more description of the cocktail itself, like image, uh, definition and abstract of it, yeah, what it's made of, how you prepare it, how you serve it. Um, and uh, cool feature, 
you can change the language of the definition of the abstract. Yeah. I will be going back to the presentation, which is mostly based on this uh, demo. So I want to tell you today how to tap into your link data, and point how you query your link data, how you display your link data, how you can display open link data. Um, then we're going to sum up and talk a bit about the power of Semantic Web, of link data, and if there's time, we'll short bonus another use case. Um, I go into the presentation with the assumption that uh, we already have um, thesaurus, yeah, or our data set, and it is available, published on the Semantic Web through a Sparkle endpoint. And this is just one representation of um, such a data. And um, in the company where I work, we have a tool called Pool Party, which makes it very easy for you to create your linked data. And uh, it's exactly this. It's all about cocktails, where I have some main beverages, different types. I have my cocktails, which are different types of cocktails. Yeah, well, I have to log in. Um, but the point is that this is a tool which is used mostly for uh, taxonomists to build their uh, thesauri, which are then used uh, by developers to build web applications on top or different other um, solutions. Yeah, I just wanted to show you one example yeah, how it looks like you can put in much more information about different cocktails, about whatever you want to do your thesaurus in your domain. And the point is that with one simple click, you can then publish your data through a Sparkle endpoint. Yeah, this is one of the features of the tool. Okay, so my assumption is we have all that in place, created, okay, we gathered a lot of cocktails, we linked uh, the ingredients together, we know which cocktail belongs to, has which kind of ingredients, and has a Sparkle endpoint where you can query your data. And this is the next point. This is actually how the data looks like, yeah? It's in RDF, it's subject, predicate, object. I highlighted for you the predicates. And this example is, for instance, about uh, brandy, yeah? Brandy has this definition, a narrow, narrower concept of brandy is Calvados, it only means that Calvados is a more specific type of brandy. But this is your data, yeah? So as a developer, you have to know how your data looks like and how your um, database looks like, first of all, so you can query it and use the data. And this whole idea of linked data makes maybe more sense now this is how the data is linked together, and then you create this big cloud around it, yeah? And uh, as you query your relational database with, Spark, uh, with uh, SQL, you query your linked data, your RDF store, your triple store, called you query it with Sparkle. And this is one, of the, one example of a query, an easy query which you already see, it goes in the direction of the model of subject, predicate, object. So you have that. You have your data in RDF format. You have a Sparkle endpoint to it. And then you want to do something with it. Yeah? You want to build a web application, maybe, as the cocktail, the Sparkling cocktail is. So for instance, if you want to find out the um, main 10 alcoholic ingredients, which I have in the main menu. The sparkling uh, query that I do is that one. It's a select query. This long URI here is the URI of the concept alcoholic beverage in my data. 
and then I simply ask it, hey, give me all the concepts, the objects, which are narrower, directly under uh, alcoholic beverages. And I get this as results. And then I use them and I display them on my web application as being the main menu, basically. I don't know if you see it very well. This is a chunk of code, which I just created uh, very fast to exemplify how you uh, work with your Sparkle endpoint. Um, like in any database, you have to create a connection yeah, to the database. You're, and the entry point in your triple store is uh, the Sparkle endpoint in this case. So, um, yeah, I just have a. I work with Java, so I have a constructor in there which takes the Sparkle endpoint as a URI uh, and sets the coding parameters. Uh, which come later from uh, when you run, for instance, the method of uh, a, a select query. You want to run a select query and you run a, a retrieve that data in uh, some way. And uh, it's also how it is or what kind of classes you use and libraries also impacts um, uh, the way you get to display and work with this link data. The, point about it being that it is very flexible and you also have to keep in mind as a developer to keep this flexibility in your implementation. Um, so the run select query is actually a post request with the select uh, query itself. And um, the classes that I use and I think the library which is more impor important is the sesame library where, uh, which I used in this case which allows me just a simpler way to work with the structure of subject, predicate, object. Yeah. And also when I retrieve the data, I want to have it in a nice and simple way to display it. I chose to retrieve it in JSON format. And just a short test. I tested if the Sparkle endpoint is uh, working and I uh, this is how you query it then based on the methods that were implemented. And this is the same query as before. And then I run uh, my query. I get the top well query uh, result, which you can iterate through. And uh, it contains a binding set. And then the binding set, you can uh, simply name it through, hey, give me the label. And the label is what I was actually uh, querying for in the first place. And then you should get the same result as through the querying directly the Sparkle endpoint, but this time done through code, yeah, through Java. And um, then you have to display your uh, result, yeah, your data that you queried. And um, I used a Spring uh, Framework web application, which uh, simply you can just use the uh, model view object. Then you create in your controller a view. Then you attach an object to the view, simple as like here. And then um, you put the results of this query, which is the same query as I showed you before. You just put it in this object, such that in your GSP, you can further um, I iterate over it and build your HTML elements. I just use the JSTL uh, library to do that, which you will come across anyway if you uh, build your application based on Spring, Spring Framework. OK. What about if you want to tap into open link data? One big uh, resource is uh, DBpedia, which is actually the same, uh, which is a representation of the Wikipedia data, but you just have it in an easy, accessible, machine-readable format. And this is the Sparkle endpoint to DBpedia. And I can run, for instance, the query, give me all the definitions that you have in DBpedia about Negroni, a specific cocktail. And then you get the different languages. And then in the front end, I can choose based on the language tag which one to display. 
I showed you before, you could choose and switch the languages. So that part in my application was coming from DBPD actually. The rest was coming from my own data, which is uh, can or cannot be open data, yeah, as you wish. Okay, um, to sum up, you might say, you might argue that you can do the same thing with relational database, with other programming languages and so on. So why semantic web technologies in the first place? Well, because, and I got to see it also um, personally, it's very easy to change data, which leads to being uh, most, more cost efficient. Uh, for instance, if you want to put a new column in your table, then you kind of need possibly someone to re-index, to create another view on your data, such that the developer can go and you know, present that part exactly as it is, or as, as, it, uh, as it is desired on the web application. Uh, well, with Semantic Web, the part, the flexible part is that you can change your data as a uh, thesaurus manager, as a taxonomist, and you don't need actually a database administrator or a developer to create this extra dimension in your data uh, set. It is, if you develop your web application flexible enough, it is very easy to change that, just by adding uh, your row in the link data. And everything that you might have seen already, everything that is creating on the semantic web has this form of a graph. So even in the triple store, everything is actually a graph. Um, so, Semantic web can be well used in any kind of problem in which a graph algorithm would help you most. For instance, finding a path, the shortest path from A to B. Then, obviously, the graph algorithms will be faster and more uh, better for you to implement, more cost-effective efficient as well. So this would be one good example of why to use semantic web technologies in the first place. And I'm uh, running out of time, but I do want to show you one more thing. Another use case for this link data is creating very fancy search applications called, this is called a faceted search. So I have here all my cocktails and I simply can drill down a bit in uh, this data by show me all the cocktails which have sugar syrup. Yeah? Then show me all the cocktails which, are, which use a high glass. And then so on, further on. And this is possible because every piece of data is linked together. So I can make these connections, I can make this filtering and drilling down into data. Use your time wisely. <laughs> so you can ask me whatever you wanted to know about semantic web. Yes. Performance. What about performance? Compare with uh, relational database. Is it comparable? So your question was um, a comparison of performance perspective between a graph database and a relational database. This depends very much on the use case on the problem you're trying to solve. As I mentioned, not everything can be solved with graph databases, but also not everything can be solved with a relational database. So the performance is exactly in this detail, in this use case. And I'm not a database expert, yeah? so I cannot go into too much detail. Yes, please. I have a question concerning the, uh, first of all, if you use any open data, and the second is the quality of the data, and what is the what is the ratio of writing queries that make sense 
and monkey patching the, the data that is not very good. Uh, so your question was related to the quality of the open data. Yeah. I <laughs> it's true that uh, open data out there on the semantic web can be or cannot be curated, quality data. So you do end up having to do some kind of checks and checking what is actually there that you get. Um, that's why in the first place we went with the idea of creating our own tool which through the front end is restricting you to do to break your data yeah so you create valid data from the beginning we also use a standard for that we have uh, a w3c standard uh, which is just uh, allowing you to create quality data then when we bring in uh, open data like DBpedia, it's also very controlled how you uh, categorize or bring the resources in the tool and then uh, expand your data. But if you want to start from scratch, you will have to do mappings between ontologies. You can end up there. You, can, you will need to see if links are still existing and not broken, if it's actually what you need. This is also done in pool part in our tool. As, as first of all, I have to know how the structure is of DBpedia to know how to navigate. And I can always uh, click on the link and see, is this really the resource that I wanted to bring into my data? Yeah, it's always a limit to that, let's say. But this is the job that you have to do as a taxonomist, especially. And this is uh, something which is not automated yet. No. But how, how can you improve the quality? Because it's only read only. It's read only, right? Who, who's writing? How can you send the feedback? Can you correct? Can you have a process which is correcting the data? I can assume that. Um, so your question was about if you can correct the data yes. or validate it. Uh, some you can. Uh, some you cannot. It depends who is publishing the data. Yeah, DBpedia is. Uh, uh, is curated constantly by uh, the University of Leipzig and you sometimes click on the resource and you see it's uh, I don't know work in progress or under construction because they are cura curating it but it is as good as the information on Wikipedia is which you know you can ask yourself also it's not always accurate but that's what collaborative and crowdsource <laughs> helps a lot and otherwise, for instance, in uh, this tool, what we also have, full party, you have validation and reporting uh, tools and features where you can check your data, check if you have uh, cycles, which is not a good practice to have, if you have uh, clashing labels and stuff like that. There are ways. My colleague, for instance, did, did a PhD on how to validate and curate your linked data, which is a research topic in itself. <laughs> More? Uh, how did you classify all these uh, drinks? Because, for example, you had uh, wine like, as a separate uh, model, like entity. Um, so uh, basically, basically uh, uh, as far as I know, like why is uh, let's call it drink uh, itself. Uh, so why is it like separated? Um, in your model, I mean. You ask me why the model was yeah. Uh, yeah. how it was before. Yeah. I can show the model again. Okay, so basically how the how the thesaurus looks like um, is a design decision of your yeah, person who is in charge, of the taxonomist. And one thing that uh, we also try to make clear to our clients is that it's an iterative process. You start with how you think that a thesaurus about cocktails should look like. One could argue that 
Instead of putting their beverages, you could have put their ingredients, yeah? And cocktails and drinkware, and that's about it. And then everything like garnish and sweeteners and sauces could be then contained in ingredients. As I say, it's a decision that the taxonomist has to make, or actually the team, but it does directly impact the developer and the uh, end application. So this thesaurus itself went through some process until I could create the web application that I wanted, the sparkling cocktail. So for instance, you see that wine is treated separately. It's not in any group. It's not non-alcoholic, it's not distilled, it's uh, distilled beverage. So we created this additional uh, concept, alcoholic beverages, and we created an extra link saying that wine is part of these alcoholic beverages, such that I, as a developer, can, through one query, get all the alcohol types of the main menu. So this is, for instance, one step that um, was needed for the developer to make his life easier and to also create a user story that was wanted to be created for the app. But it had several changes. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a cycling, it's a psychic process. Yes, please. Uh, what are the practical implementations of this semantic web? For example, uh, Wilhelm has web page with selling products and how should how could they map this these connections with their products and label them or, or what's the practical aspect? Um, by now the big players and I mean that by, so you asked me what is what are other use cases, yeah? So big companies already know what the power of semantic web is. Uh, most of them, and um, it is pretty broad, but if we're talking about e-commerce, um, for instance, if you think about the fact that you have a big store, e-commerce store, which has thousands and thousands of products, and each product must be presented in different languages because your website can be translated in different languages of different sides of the globe and then each product in one particular language has also a lot of synonyms I don't know a dog type of some breed has 10 other names which is actually the same breed but I as a user when I for instance search for a product of a specific dog breed I want to get all the products not just of the exact word I search for, but for the exact concept that I search for. So all this gathered information that they have implemented or they have embedded in their website is flowing into such a big model, like you see here. And we call this going away from a term perspective to a concept perspective of your data. Because this is what you can do. For instance, brandy is uh, represented for me here in English. And these are, for instance, synonyms of the word brandy. But when I look as a user for, I don't know, fruit brandy, I want to get all the products which are related to brandy, actually, and not just fruit brandy. And this is where you make a difference. It's way much easier to uh, do this in such a model with, and then in the end with link data semantic web technologies. And I think my time is up. I am around. Grab me by the hand. I have a lot of examples that I can show you and open your mind to semantic web in general. Thank you.